Hello, everyone. Welcome to another capsule on international relations for the Shankar IAS Academy. This is the time we are celebrating Asadika Amrit Mahotsav. And this celebration of 75th year of independence will continue throughout the year. And you can naturally expect a vast amount of material available making an assessment of the past 75 years and making projections for the future. In fact, the Prime Minister's idea is that this year should be used to envisage the centenary year of Indian independence. Where do we stand at 75 and where are we going to in 100? So a lot of material is already available, historic, political, cultural, social, all aspects have been analyzed and there's plenty of material available. In fact, I understand that from the Lal Bahadur Shastri Academy in uh, Missouri, that this whole year, those who are joining the service will be treated as the uh, Azadi Ka Amrut Mahotsav officers. And they will be given a new <coughs> orientation, a new training program. In fact, the director wrote to all the new officers recruited, the probationers, to expect a lot of unexpected things during this year. So that follows that those who are taking the examination this year also, or early next year, will also be have to be prepared to have a very clear understanding of the 75 years of India's independence. Of course, I shall refrain myself to speaking about foreign policy where it stands and the way we came up to this point. So uh, to start with the latest, we all know that the world is between two orders. One world order which has exhausted itself and become more or less irrelevant. And the new world order is yet to be born. So we are celebrating our 75th anniversary at a time of uncertainty. There are many imponderables in the world, and we really do not know where the world is going. One may look back with nostalgia at the period of the Cold War when everything was predictable. But now nothing is predictable, and uh, we do not know what the new world order will be. The tendency is for everyone uh, to weigh chances, balances, calculations, and so on, and uh, remain unattached to any particular group or country, and uh, keeping all their options open. And that is the situation today. So we have to, as India, I believe, uh, have to look at our policy over 75 years and see which portions of it or which are the uh, elements in it which would remain valid even in a new world order. So a couple of things we can immediately identify. Uh, though India has a very dynamic foreign policy, many things have remained constant. Many things are relevant and, and two of them is one is that we are expecting or working towards a multipolar world, neither a bipolar or unipolar world. And that one objective remains steady as far as we are concerned. How far we are to this kind of dream, we don't know. We'll have to uh, work for it. We have to uh, go around the problems that we face today, all this is necessary to have some kind of a, an arrangement in which India is, becomes one of the poles of the world. Uh, the second thing that uh, is always valid is the strategic, strategic autonomy, what we used to call non-alignment in the past during the Cold War. So after the Cold War, we have started calling it a much more realistic name in the sense that we are not non-aligned to anybody or aligned to anybody, but we, the more correct expression is that we are independent in thought and action. So this is something that we hold very dear. And uh, whatever uh, new world order 
is generated. We will probably stick to these two in spite of all the challenges we have. So, but both these are under threat, the multipolar world as well as our ability to remain uh, totally independent in foreign policy. These are not very easy to accomplish, uh, but those remain our objectives. And, and that gives us a fairly good basis uh, to assess the 75 years of Indian independence and the foreign policy of today. So as I said, the situation is very fragile and uh, there's a state of flux and uh, everybody is uh, soft balancing as they say, some writers say, or they are trying to remain neutral in certain cases and uh, making, waiting for an opportunity for things to stabilize. But at the same time, each one of the countries, particularly the major countries, are trying to shape the world order in their own, according to their own dreams. And in this, the most prominent country in the world today, which is trying to change the world according to its own calculations, is, of course, China. Uh, but even the others, most, any country, if you look at, you will find that each one, everyone is uh, uh, trying to figure out the future and uh, try to influence the shape of the world, particularly the nuclear powers, the permanent members. All of them are interested. They are not, none of them is happy with the present situation as well as they are concerned. Everyone has some issue or the other, and all these have been uh, considerably accentuated uh, by the 9-11, by the economic crisis of 2008, then the um, pandemic, and then the Ukraine war. There were many other developments, but these were perhaps the most important developments of the last 20 years. And um, so these have all had a very tremendous impact on every country in the world. In fact, the humanity itself has changed after 9-11, after 2008 economic crisis, after the pandemic, and during, we cannot say after yet, during the Ukraine war. So no one is happy with the situation as it is today, and therefore there is this very serious effort being made by all of them uh, to assert themselves and try to shape the world according to their own dreams. And speaking of India's dreams, uh, we know that uh, we have always have seen ourselves as part of the global situation, uh, the Vasudhaida Vakudumbagam kind of approach. That is, uh, of course, we want our own place in the international community. We want to be recognized as a powerful influence in the world, as a major economic power. Um, with a sufficient capacity for defense. And uh, so we have our own dreams about India. We want to be a permanent member of the Security Council. We want to be uh, self-sufficient in uh, whatever we can do and also live at peace with the world. But in addition to that, Indian foreign policy has an element where we would like to contribute to the world rather than demand anything from the world. Because in the United Nations itself, our policy has not been to demand things, but to contribute our experience and to contribute to the global good. So that is what India has been trying to do, not to extract anything from the international community. Because the only time when we went with a problem to the UN was uh, about Jammu and Kashmir. That was the time when we expected that the UN would solve that problem, and therefore we with good intentions, went to the UN and sought the UN's help. But last 75 years, we have seen that that is not possible. The UN is not a judicial body. It is not a democratic body. It's a body of nations interested in their own interests and welfare. And therefore, any issue which goes before the UN, particularly the Security Council, will be looked upon by these countries as a kind of occasion, opportunity, for themselves to gain something out of the system. So that is what happened in the case of Jammu and Kashmir. When it came into the Security Council, each country, particularly the powerful countries, wanted to look at it from the perspective of 
what it can gain from the Kashmir issue, what influence they can wield over Pakistan and India. And therefore, fairness was not there, justice was not there, and therefore we are more or less in the same situation as we were at that time. But Kashmir has moved on, we have moved on, and the United Nations, like in other issues, has become irrelevant in uh, this uh, matter. And this has taught us a lesson. After that, we have never taken an issue of concern to us, to the UN. We uh, take, speak at the UN basically about concerns of the universe. Big issues like terrorism, or climate change, or equitable distribution of wealth. Um, these are the kind of areas in which we are working. So we are not seeking anything for ourselves. So in the sense that uh, we cooperate, uh, you know, uh, develop cooperation within the United Nations, South-South cooperation, North-South cooperation. So these areas that we are really, really working. You may remember that when we were president of the Security Council, we did several things which are of great importance to the world as a whole, not particularly for India. So that way, we are not seeking anything from the United Nations. So because so the United Nations, if it has become irrelevant, that doesn't make much difference to us. We are still dedicated to peace and cooperation and stability. But the fact that the UN is weak has changed the attitude of the world towards it. And the biggest failure of the UN in recent years was the, at the time of the pandemic, that the UN could not uh, involve the entire United Nations into that uh, battle, like it did in the case of HIV, AIDS, or Ebola. It was not left to the WHO to deal with such crises. It was dealt with by the entire United Nations machinery. Uh, but because of China being a permanent member with a veto power, uh, they did not allow the United Nations to even hold a meeting on the you know, pandemic, and therefore total disunity. So one of the basic uh, uh, difference today is that the world is not united on anything, not even in a crisis situation like that. Of course, uh, after a couple of years, after the pandemic came about, uh, countries started cooperating. But in the beginning, you saw that there was no effort of multilateral, multilateral approach and uh, we tried it with SAR, we tried it with G20, but everywhere people were fending for themselves. And even the European Union did not work in unison at that time. Uh, Italians were running around, others, and there was no real cooperation, but it was built up. The Quad came into it, other regional organizations came into it. But multilateralism at the UN level failed miserably during the, during the pandemic. Uh, of course, 9-11 um, changed our security concerns and um, it became obvious that military power or nuclear power is not enough uh, to save your own country because what happened on 9-11, they did not use nuclear weapons or even guns. What they used was only knives and forks. So with that, they were able to bring down a major nuclear power to its knees. And that's a lesson for disarmament and security and so on. So, so the new world order in security is also adrift. It is not yet settled down. Uh, very a few months ago, the uh, permanent five, I think it was early 2022, uh, that the permanent members uh, made a declaration about nuclear weapons. In order to satisfy the non-nuclear weapon states, they said, you know, we will never use the nuclear weapons. Uh, war, nuclear war is not winnable and should never be fought. This is what they said. But within a few months, we saw one of the permanent members saying that uh, he is ready uh, to use nuclear weapons if their wish for a new world order is not fulfilled. So that shows that... Uh, the change in the world towards nuclear weapons has not changed. We are thinking in terms of, of uh, global zero through disarmament. But who is talking about global zero? Uh, President um, uh, Barack Obama talked about a world without nuclear weapons. He said, of course, not in my time, not in my lifetime, not 
in several years, but eventually United States will not have to depend on nuclear power, nuclear uh, weapons for security. But that's also forgotten. Nobody is talking about global zero. Nobody is talk talking about a world without nuclear weapons. They talk about disarmament, but disarmament, as you know, is a very slow process. And uh, NPT and CTBT are both discriminatory. And um, so it is not fair on all the countries. It is still under the thumb of the permanent members. Um, then, of course, the Ukraine, the Russia-Ukraine war, or the Russian invasion of Ukraine, to say put it plainly, uh, has also brought about big changes in the world. So the first of it, first of the changes was the Russia-China uh, friendship and their decision to work together, which has implications not only for Ukraine, but also for Taiwan. And it has uh, a very great significance for us because a disengagement in Ladakh has not taken place till today. And the Russians, if they are going to support China on any such uh, conflicts, then it won't be very new. Russia has never supported us against China, but at least they were trying to bring India and uh, China together early at the time of the Ladakh crisis. Uh, but that is not out of the way now. So, so we have to uh, realize that uh, the relationship with uh, China, the structure has changed. All the agreements that we had reached with China, which enabled the border to be peaceful and uh, tranquil, have been lost. And now we have to start from scratch, even the punch shield is not being respected. And China is holding on to its ground that they will do what they want to do. And um, the others just have to accept it. So on China, where will we go? What kind of negotiations will take place on the border? What will be their action? Because there are many, there are many ominous moves on their side, of moving of troops and clearing of roads. And uh, there is no sign of disengagement from the territory they have occupied in 2020. So we need a, a tragic strategy for China. Pakistan also at a standstill uh, because uh, uh, we are unable to have any kind of dialogue with them because unless they give up their uh, terrorism, we are pledged not to deal with uh, the, so the so that's a standstill. Uh, SARC does not, is not active. Then other neighbors, we know the issues of Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, etc. So what we started, what the Prime Minister, what Prime Minister Modi started with of the uh, neighbors first policy has not been very, very successful. So if you look at the balance sheet for India, as it is now, we can see that uh, the, our problems have only increased and not reduced as a result of the latest developments. Uh, Russia has been a friend and we continue to maintain that historic relationship, uh, but that has raised uh, problems with others. Uh, United States never brought in our relations with Soviet Union as a hindrance to US-India relationship. But they are increasingly becoming more and more conscious of that. They will make it a test whether India is willing to turn away from Russia and uh, be a good Quad member, because Quad is supposed to be a very selective group from in which India is there. All the others are already military allies. And therefore, India has a very unique position in the Quad. So they are looking at it, whether we are going to change our policy towards Russia, because Russia stands condemned by the West uh, for, the, uh, for the aggression. And uh, Russia has not done well, and therefore things could get worse. So even if you not look at the rest of the world, for India itself, we are at a very important turning point. And uh, obviously, maybe many things which we don't know publicly, but the effort is being made to calm down all these uh, problems, difficulties, 
uh, Europe particularly has been anxious about India. And, um, you know, they, they feel that uh, we are bursting the sanctions and uh, trying to help Russia in the war, which is not true. Uh, but still, the Europeans seem to think that way, and therefore, there is pressure on us. At the same time, one sees reports about India uh, planning various methods by which we can uh, make payment arrangements to Russia. We can get oil without interruption. And these are things which are attracting adverse attention uh, from the rest of the world. And even about the internal situation in India, there are concerns. People say India is only 30% uh, democracy. We're measuring it in terms of uh, percentages and uh, individual freedoms. All these have been raised by these countries. So we are not in a very happy position at the moment. And nobody, is, as I said, other countries are also not in a happy position. So everybody is trying to change the world and uh, what actually exactly will come out of it. And therefore, the issues of which require great attention, like poverty, like the crisis in Sri Lanka, or climate change, and uh, supply chains issues. So these are all the things that people should dis be discussing and uh, finding ways for cooperation. But that's not where we are happening. We are having these group meetings, G7 and G20 and others, but there is no unity there. Multilateralism has not uh, worked very well in all these meetings. You get a G20, but some of them, you know, make go and make a separate statement. You go to a CEO, some of them make some separate statements. So these multilateral bodies, meetings, have proved to be divisive rather than cohesive. So that is a major, major concern. So when we look at look back at our record of the last 75 years, I'm not going to great details, but we had a very golden period from 1947 to 1962, uh, when you know, India was considered a beacon of hope and peace and prosperity, and uh, we were helping the UN to shape itself. And then suddenly the Chinese aggression and our total defeat at the hands of the Chinese changed that completely uh, because India was found to be weak and not determined, not decisive, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And therefore, uh, it became necessary after Pandit Nehru, uh, we had to move from an ideological phase to a pragmatic phase with Mrs. Gandhi as the uh, leader of, uh, of that phase. And um, we became more uh, closer to the Soviet Union. That solved a lot of problems for us. But at the same time, it created many problems. But we were not entirely ideologically otherwise close to Soviet Union. It was a pragmatic, practical relationship. We were able to supply things to Soviet Union. And we were able to get what we needed, very heavy machinery and you know, structures, etc., for India. And an exchange was possible. So we reached the rupee a ruble arrangement, which enabled us to conserve our foreign exchange and have our development without any, any obstruction. But that, that situation also changed with the collapse of the Soviet Union. For a little while, we were, like today, bewildered by the situation because suddenly it became a more unipolar world. And India, by making a good approach and a liberal, liberalized approach, Dr. Manmohan Singh and uh, uh, Sri P. V. Narasimha Rao, they got us out of, out of that. And uh, our liberalization, globalization, etc., uh, created an atmosphere for growth. And India started growing at very high rates, 10%, 11%. And so we could, uh, we, uh, you know, survived that, that period. And uh, in the unipolar world, like everybody else, we also clo got closer to the United States. The nuclear deal brought some solution to the nuclear issue, which was the most difficult, uh, because the United States was totally opposed to India not signing the NPT. And uh, so the nuclear deal gave us an opportunity to uh, develop our nuclear power uh, without signing the NPT. And that was a major achievement. 
It was a major concession by the United States. So, so that practical uh, period then moved on to a globalized period in the foreign policy uh, because we opened up our markets and uh, India became one of the biggest markets in the world. So countries of the world, companies, all of them started rushing to India. The largest number of visitors to India came at that time. And thus, uh, we gained by that. We were champions of globalization. Uh, we are not worse like that now. And um, you know, US relations flourished at that time. When Mr. Narendra Modi became prime minister, he promoted India-US relations even further. And he declared in 2016 that there is a new symphony in the orchestra between US and uh, India. Then, of course, there was a setback when President uh, Trump came about, but we survived that, and Trump became a friend rather than a, a rival. And uh, that phase also was over. And President Biden, of course, hasn't had the chance to come to India, but our prime minister visited the United States, and we have some basic understanding. But the Democrats generally are not happy with India's uh, human rights record. And uh, so, but at this time, they are not very worried about that because they have their own war in their hands. And so, but there is no clear signal uh, from the United States that India is a matter of priority for them. But as a Quad member, they, we expect and they expect close cooperation. And the Quad has moved away from the idea of containment of China, although that was part of the philosophy, but they moved on to other issues like climate change and the pandemic and uh, supply chains, etc. So, so a certain amount of cooperation has been built up. So people are now looking outside the UN, you know, groupings which have no veto power. And they are the ones which are playing some role in the international community, in the multilateral world. But as far as UN is considered, our message is very clear. UN is, particularly Security Council, is not representative of the world of uh, 2022. It is still in the world of 1947. So we want a reformed multilateralism. We want a reformed United Nations. But there is no formula today by which everybody will agree to a kind of change. So the UN is uh, completely at sea. They are doing the usual normal uh, peace activities, development activities, whatever, whatever resources they have. But beyond that, it does not play a, a role in world affairs anymore. People are looking at things from, uh, from different perspectives. And so well, the Russia-Ukraine war, nobody knows how long it will go on and what the end result will be. But now increasingly people are saying that Russia is gaining ground. And that is dangerous because that means that Russia will not want a ceasefire. It will not want to go back to the negotiating table. And uh, the West will have to uh, multiply their uh, support to Ukraine and give them all the arms and ammunition and money. You know, one month, uh, Ukraine spends much more than what Sri Lanka wants to clear their debts. That is the scale. You know, people are dying in Sri Lanka because they have no resources. And Ukraine, all the resources are being wasted and people are still dying. So that is the irony of the situation. And India had no choice but to, not to remain neutral, but to remain conscious of the two sides and at the same time, ask for a just and fair solution. That's why India has been repeatedly asking for a ceasefire and negotiations. But nobody seems to be listening to us. They have their calculations. Virtually every prime minister or president must have approached Mr. Push, Mr. Putin by now. But he doesn't seem to con consider himself amenable to any kind of advice. And now he, we don't even know what his objective is. What is victory for him? We don't know yet. Each stage we thought that uh, this would be enough for him. and uh, But then he, he asked for more and more. And so we are also in a situation where we are not able to take any major initiatives 
in the international uh, field. So as I wrote from the Hindu the other day, I, I said that uh, there is not much point in going to all these multilateral forums, except to make our presence felt. That is necessary. But reforming these multilateral forums from inside does not appear to be very possible because the time is not right. Once the global situation stabilizes and the permanent five and the other big countries find their places and feel themselves comfortable, the, the new order cannot be established. And that is the unfortunate part. So uh, in summary, what I'm saying is that uh, the golden period or the ideological period is past. We have moved on to a pragmatic period. Then we went into a globalized period. And then with Mr. Modi, we reached a kind of assertive period. Because he started demanding rather than requesting uh, countries to cooperate with us. Because he has this sense that India is a major important country. And we are not there to seek any kind of uh, concessions. We are asking for our rights. That is his approach. But he failed to get the permanent seat. He failed even to get the uh, membership of the nuclear suppliers group uh, because the reality of the world is such that these things are not given easily. And the NPT and CTBT are still staring at our face and saying, and people will say, we are we'll be happier if you still sign the NPT and so on. So, but we have stood our ground. So that is the basic thing that we can say. Uh, Prime Minister, Narendra Modi had three or four major ob objectives, development, security, neighborhood, and diaspora. So in many, in all these areas, he has taken many initiatives. They have made uh, uh, life different for all these people, but you cannot say that he accomplished all this. The first term looked better. And uh, towards the end, it was the nationalism and uh, Pakistan and all that which helped him to win the election. Uh, but after that, you know, there are so many issues and the global issues facing him. So, but uh, as, as I said, when we started, uh, we have all these, you know, like the idea of a multipolar world is one, strategic autonomy is one, and we are trying to apply those principles to the current situation. And uh, of course, we don't know the details, uh, but we need to be prepared uh, for China's expansionism. Uh, we are not able to impose sanctions on China because we are dependent on China. And the Russians may be prevented from giving us uh, more military equipment by the big powers for the various uh, ways. And we ourselves may not want to associate ourselves totally with Russia and uh, help the war effort. So a very, very careful balancing is being taken. And uh, sometimes India sounds combative because we fight for our rights. We fight for what is right and what is just. But that's not what other countries want. The other countries want accommodation. The other countries want you to understand their problems. And then that race, you know, it may happen that we may have to again rethink how we approach these countries. Because totally independent foreign policy is not a very a practical way because you need things from other people. No country is in the world is self-sufficient. We can argue a point here, a point there, uh, but to win over the world, you need accommodation, you need uh, uh, negotiation, you need a com you know, compromises. So we'll go into that process once the world is uh, stabilized. So it is fair to say that, uh, uh, you know, we are caught between two worlds, one world which is dying out and the other world has not emerged as yet. Fully. And that is the uncertainty of the, of the present situation. And that makes uh, foreign policy activities more difficult. But uh, things can change and uh, we can expect that they are sticking to our principles and also following certain policies of giving importance more to global issues rather than 
individual issues. I think India may come out successful in the future. How long? Nobody knows. How much? Nobody knows. Uh, but we have certain strengths and uh, those will come into play eventually. India's advice will be heard, I'm sure, like it happened in the case of the economic crisis in 2008. It was Dr. Manmohan Singh who set the agenda. So similarly, we may be able to set the agenda for the future. So it is tough, but not impossible for India to come out successfully in this uh, uh, crisis. Thank you very much. I mentioned to you that I have written a book on the Foreign Service for specifically the purposes of aspirants. And that book is available in the Shankar uh, bookstore. There's only a 142 page book, costs only 250 rupees. So I have said a lot about this in, the, in this forum. What do we need to fear? We have to fight with all this. Every disease here has to be fought. The point I was uh, making about was that international cooperation, which was available at the time of HIV, is not available at the time of Corona. And that is sad. And the reason is China. China prevented the United Nations to, from taking any action uh, about, uh, about Corona. And that is a sad commentary on the world situation. That is not only a hypothetical question, that is an unlikely uh, situation too. Uh, because China is not only a rival, but also an adversary. So I cannot uh, visualize any situation where we we'll join hands with China for whatever good it is. We have cooperated with China many times on several issues, trade. Uh, in fact, India and China were on the same side in the WTO. And also, uh, we were on the same side in the time of climate change. But even those have changed. And the fundamental problem with China is our fundamental structure of our relationship with China. So we have to build it all up. But uh, we'll find ourselves on the other side of China for a, for a long time to come. I have no expectation. I already mentioned how the P5 countries are uh, not working in the interest of the UN. They don't consider it importance, but at the same time, they want to retain their domination of the organization. And uh, so they are moving the chessboard in order to shape it according to their own calculations. So you have just witnessed in Chennai, the World Chess Championship. So it's a very intricate exercise and it takes a long time, you need a lot of patience. So, but everybody is engaged in finding things for themselves inside the UN and outside. Any reform will be in the interest of the powerful people. And so P5 and Citra and the UNO are not very helpful at this particular time. Because uh, if you look at all these statements coming out of these recent uh, um, conferences, they are all old ideas, not new ideas. You know? And uh, so what is the point in just reproducing what you have said before? And they, are, they don't have the courage to say anything about what is happening today. So that's a difficult situation. Well, New Quad is, um, I suppose you are referring to India, Israel, US, and UAE, I presume, because that is a New Quad. And of course, it has uh, uh, the other name, I2, U2. So maybe it is not a not quad anymore, but there is also, you know, the Americans have a quad in Central Europe, Central Asia also. So this is fashionable, uh, but the real quad, as you know, is uh, not yet a military pact, but it was designed like that, and that is why another uh, AUKUS came in because it was not really uh, working very well. So. Nothing much to be said about this. The new part is, uh, if you are referring to uh, I2U2, then that is potential. 
and they have chosen certain areas, uh, food, uh, manufacture, uh, investments, and so on. So that's how it works. No, we cannot say that we are walking in the same path. We are fundamentally committed to uh, the principles in the, of the country. And um, the two things, the multipolar world and the strategic, strategic autonomy are very important. But I cannot, having followed several prime ministers and their foreign policy, I cannot say that we are not making changes. We have made important changes, and that is necessary in a dynamic world. As I said, independent foreign policy is not so easy. Not only uh, somebody like Pol Pot or uh, Nevin, who can do independent foreign policy, can, don't care less for the world, rest of the world. But that's not how India is doing it. We are trying to uh, be firm but polite and want to be accommodative. But India's future has to be uh, bright. Uh, because we have all the ingredients of it. We have a big population, we have a democratic dividend. The young people are full of energy. In fact, I was having a conversation with uh, a Nobel laureate, uh, Dr. Mohammed El Garadai of the Atomic Energy Agency, and he presented a very gloomy picture. And then I asked him, so what for the future? He said, our children. Because he says that our children are not influenced by all these prejudices that our generation has. Caste, community, religion, uh, you know, all kinds of divisive forces. But you talk to your children, they are not even aware of it. They are only thinking of what they can do to contribute. To. So he said, the future is bright because the young people will be cleverer than we are. We may have to apologize to them for not doing enough for them. But uh, what can you do? So they have to grow up and claim their own position and they'll be more principled, they'll be more balanced, and they'll be technologically more equipped. So as for the future of India, I have no, no doubts. But we are at the moment in an uncertain uh, period as far as foreign policy is concerned. But New Delhi, Beijing's New Delhi policy is of uh, domination. There's no question about it. They want to alter the borders uh, unilaterally. They have given no uh, signal of uh, compromise or uh, fairness or reasonableness. So that is our first headache. Most important headache is China for the next 30, 40 years. Till we also reach that level of development. Because at the moment, it is not an equal battle. Five billion against uh, five, five trillion is what we're dreaming about. And they already crossed 15 trillion. So where do we stand? And look at the army, look at the nuclear capability, all that. So it's, a, it's not a balanced relationship. So it will have its own problems. Well, there is no uh, conflict between multilateralism and regionalism. And regional arrangements are mentioned in the UN Charter because the world, all issues of the world cannot be handled by the United Nations from New York. So regional countries have to chip in in order to solve this problem. Like, for example, African quarrels and issues. First of all, they are very sensitive. They don't want others to deal with it. So they decide to go to OE or Organization of African Unity, or now it is called uh, African Union. It's only in name. Uh, so regionalism is not conflict, not in conflict with uh, uh, multilateralism. No. But as I mentioned in my uh, presentation, what I was saying was that because the UN is not working effectively, you are saying UN is functioning, but it's not functioning effectively. And um, um, terrorism is one example. Uh, the pandemic is another example where the United Nations is not effective, and not even preventing wars. And so 
that is why people are looking for alternatives. People, because people think uh, that it is the veto which is creating the problem. So they are looking at organizations without veto. Like G20, nobody has a veto. General Assembly, there is no veto. So uh, therefore, people are looking at alternatives. But UN is indispensable for various other things, so specialized agencies, and development, atomic energy, and food security. There are several things that the UN does. And so it will be it'll remain valid. But it is definitely these regional groups and groupings will become stronger. But even in these regional groups, the unity is not visible at this time. And that is my, my concern. Yes, the trend today it looks as though it is inevitable. Uh, a conflict is inevitable and nuclear weapons may be used. But people are wise and uh, hopefully that danger will not come. And that is why problems have to be resolved all the time to prevent the necessity for conflict and necessity for use of nuclear weapons. And that is something which people have to bear in mind all the time. And so, uh, certainly, uh, nuclear war has to be avoided. Uh, even threat of nuclear wars should be avoided. And uh, that is why we have the no, use, no first use uh, principle which some of us subscribe, some of us subscribe to. And uh, if more and more countries come to that non first use principle, like Pakistan or United States or others, then we'll be better off as far as nuclear situation is concerned. But 80% is an underestimate. More than 80% will die. And uh, the world will be somewhat desolate. But at the moment, there is no Tamil issue for us to intervene. We are simply uh, helping to rebuild those regions. And there is no conflict. Uh, the tigers have gone away. The, the, the Sri Lankan government is pretending that it's a united country and everybody is the same. But now that is not the focus. The focus is on poverty and disaster. And so Tamil issue, etc. are not relevant anymore. Everybody has to work together in Sri Lanka and be from outside for all the people of Sri Lanka, not for just for the Tamils. So the Tamil situation has completely changed. And nobody has the time for it in Sri Lanka because of the other preoccupations. Otherwise, the whole world would have come to Sri Lanka's help at this point. But it is not even newspaper reports in the West. They say, uh -huh, Sri Lanka, India and China can sort it out. That is the approach they take. So a race or double issue is not, at the, not on the front line now. It is rescuing Sinhalese and Tamils from total disaster. And nobody seems to raise a hand for that. And that is the strategy. Well, as of now, it doesn't look possible because we are unable to change even a word in the United Nations Charter. So there is no agreement for an alternative. People are talking about alternatives, but then they come back to the original thing. So, uh, why destroy something which is available even if it is not very effective? That is the and it has certain values as a moral force, as a developing agent, development agency, etc. But building a new United Nations will mean uh, a big change, and I don't think we are ready for it as yet. Imagine another San Francisco conference and. Then it was only 51 countries, not just 193 countries. Imagine sitting down and writing a new charter. That would be rather impossible. Now I think Belt and Road, Road Initiative is countering itself. It is not fashionable anymore. Of course, everybody in the world has joined it, except India. Uh, but everybody is skeptical about its uh, objectives. And after what happened in Sri Lanka, it should be a lesson to everybody. And there are other countries who have doubts about that. So we don't need to counter it. We simply have to um, keep out of it and uh, develop with our own, our own priorities. 
but uh, alternatives are being looked for. US is talking about some kind of a, a building of uh, uh, structures uh, like uh, the one in about uh, communications and so on. Others also are thinking of counter, but we are not thinking of any counter uh, uh, measures. What we don't like is that uh, this kind of dumping money and technology and uh, Chinese uh, workers in these countries and creating debt traps. We are not attracted by it. And most other countries are also coming to that uh, conclusion. So, and I have a feeling that uh, Belt and Road Initiative will uh, gradually disappear. And of course, the Chinese will come up with something new after, the, after President Xi becomes the life president of uh, China later this year. Then more things will happen and more ideas will come. Please read my book to understand the increasing relevance of the Foreign Service. And in the last chapter, I have referred to diplomats not as uh, ambassadors, plenipotentiary and extraordinary. Those are the old days. Now we are the Sherpas. You know, there is an official designation for the uh, G20 meeting, for example. You know, the former... Um, CEO of Niti IO is the Sherpa, as you know, you may have heard. And now, all the world over, major initiatives, major conferences, etc. The chief diplomat is a Sherpa. Sherpa, as you know, is uh, people who work for work hard and don't reach the summit, but the summit years get all the credit. So diplomacy has changed its role. We don't have a, a, a role of deciding everything. And, declaring wars and peace, that's over, because presidents and prime ministers talk to each other. What we need to do is to prepare the ground for them to come together and uh, bring about a change. And that role is much bigger than the ceremonial role that we have. So that is how I see it. This is a time that the foreign service and diplomatic service is much more relevant and much more effective and much more needed. This is a whole purpose of my book, explaining why the global situation demands greater um, efficiency from the diplomats. And that's why I regret uh, that the best in the list uh, do not opt for the Foreign Service. So my whole plea is that please understand what the Foreign Service is before you take a decision for or against. Even to take a decision against it, you need to know what it's all about. So I hope you read the book and then we can have another discussion. Thank you very much for the active session. Thank you.